Hi, I'm Todd Gannon and this is the Syrup Channel. I'm here in downtown Los Angeles at the Industry Gallery with Elena Manfredini. We're here to talk today about her new exhibition, Building Portraits. The work in the exhibition chronicles a series of architectural experiments. Elena, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what you're up to. This is a collection of 42 drawings. Uh, part of them were done uh, for the Art Institute in Chicago. They were tackling the problem of facades, fenestrations, and grids. Anything that you see in this room uh, puts together two fields of art and design, art and architecture. So the building is a bit on architecture and portrait is a bit on art. The work at the beginning really started from the inspiration coming from Chicago and seeing Mies van der Rohe's work in Chicago. And I decided to look at nine of the most important buildings of Mies van der Rohe and how then I could weave graphic qualities and my own take on fenestration into his buildings. I think the work has been developing in the past two years in my office and we were tackling some ideas about competitions or we were finalists in some projects and a lot of those actually were facades projects. We started thinking about how we could think about these drawings in terms of buildings. So here we have three of the images that were originally shown in the Chicago show at the Art Institute. Yes, I think these three drawings exemplify quite a bit, quite a bit the fascination with facades and what the project really wanted to try to do. If you can see and you get closer to these drawings, you see there is behind uh, the grid, actually a real picture of a facade of uh, Mies van der Rohe that I started weaving with graphic images on top. And each of these three began with a single Mies building or it's already a composite of several buildings? Single Mies building. So okay. each of these are three different scale of the same building actually, just different scales of weaving. The idea was to try to first of all understand that in Mies work, uh, the sort of mullions and reflections that happen on the surface are actually quite lively and the relationship between buildings create a reflection on each other that have actually incredible effectual output and play with it in a contemporary notion of the grid. So I thought the grid is what really characterized uh, Chicago in many ways, the, the grid of the city and the grid of the buildings, but then those grids start to become alive through the reflections of multiple be buildings being next to each other. I think it was a bit of a discover about the relationship between pixelated images or pictures as we call them or drawings, architectural drawings made out of vectors and how they could be woven together somehow. It was really trying to put together the dirty quality of an image that is actually a picture taken, you can tell that this is the windows and the details of an habitation inside, and how this become abstract through a series of chronicle of line work. So how do you abstract a picture is really a, the basic discovery of the tools, I think. Basically how to create a grid of vectors from a picture and that actually becomes tectonic and has a geometrical quality. And from the picture it becomes a facade to close the gap between, I think, two different ways of understanding drawings, really. Some are picture and renderings and some are actually technical drawings. This one seems to be a little bit more uh, building-like, let's yes. say. No, you're absolutely right. Let's say that at the beginning I worked with a two-by-two -two grid, uh, which really was coming from the grid of Chicago, and at the end I started to think, what if then I really make an argument about the relationship between fenestration and facade not being linear. And what if we have multiple scale of facade fenestration, whereas the building in the back is always the same. And I really gave myself the assignment of looking at different colleges, housing typology, tower, office towers, uh, even uh, going into some industrial buildings. And how did those different building types affect the experiments you were doing? It was at some point to see simply the limits of the tricks and the techniques and to see what they would add to uh, an established silhouette. If you have an expectations from a building of the kind of inhabitation, given program, housing, would have certain amount of fenestration, uh -huh. an industrial building would maybe not have the same one, then how would the grid inform the topology and how would the grid trick the viewer in thinking that inhabitation happens at a certain scale? So is that something that we'd be seeing here? So th this is housing? Or this, this is housing. Begins in housing? Yes, begins in housing. And so there's, there's definitely a kind of A, B, a, a prime or a prime. C. Yes. The, the ghost yes. of the Miesian sources. It's, it's uh, quite there. It's yes. still there versus this, I guess, would be an office tower. Yes, it comes from an office tower of, of Mies, actually, and the picture is a very, kind of, a very famous picture of Mies at the sunset right. with the yellow light inside and the blackness outside. And I started to think, what if we then think about um, 
multiplying the square twice, which is what happened here, uh -huh. because the picture really is only this much. And then I start multiplying and start seeing how then would you tackle the bottom of the building, the crown of the building, and how would you then create the three parts of the canonical uh, skyscraper, mid rise, let's say. This really kind of maintains that yes. Lewis Sullivan base middle top, almost classical I th organization. I, I tower. think most of them have an idea about edges that combines the parti the party of a building, yes, I agree with you, and then it tries somehow to weave them within the facade. But definitely there is a very conscious decision about the hierarchy of, of the project. That hierarchy, the slip between the various zones yes. is important. So yes. the, this zone through here, or that zone through there, is important in the way that it starts to break down that distinction between yeah. yes. the base and the middle and the top. I think the drawing, um, do a lot of work in terms of um, the relationship between uh, picture and drawings, but then they became limited in, in many ways for me to understand what could happen if I would not look at those things only as an elevation. And that's why I moved from these views and to consider this as facade into actually understand this as complete envelopes. And in this three-dimensional exploration, I started projecting the drawings at different angles and you can tell that here you can see the fenestration moving around as a projection and somehow really challenging the horizontality of the floor slabs and the verticality of the and structure. So the projections are not only uh, each of the surfaces are not regular to one another but also the projection is not regular to the surface. Correct. Yes, they're not. Yeah, yes. so, you, so it almost it begins to read as a kind of isometric. Yes. The, the argument was that the facade and the fenestration are actually two different systems now. Let's talk a little bit more about some of these terminological distinctions. Uh, let's begin with the difference between the picture and a drawing. Architectural drawings in general have always this inherent duality because they want to be, on one hand, a technical drawing to get built. I mean, they need to show the skills of the architect into getting something done. And on the other hand, they are a picture of something that is not there yet. So there is a quality of imagination and um, speculation of what the future of this building could be. And they're always in this tension. One is a sour fare of the artist and the other one is a technical mind of the architect. And somehow the architectural drawing always occupy a very difficult zone where you never know where you are. The tendencies change according to how we use tools. And I think in the past 20 years with the digital revolution in many ways, pictures and drawings became associated with different roles of the architect. The picture is the rendering and has always a commercial quality to it. The picture is what you show a client to make them believe that uh -huh. that act of creativity could be built and the technical drawing is what you give to uh, a contractor to build. So somehow this two polarized nature of the drawings I think are even more distant as of now. So I think somewhat this exhibition wanted to challenge this common idea about what architectural drawings can be, either a picture or a technical drawing, and actually coming together and finding a place of creativity. Traditionally, the architectural drawing was a specific kind of medium yes. that had a specific audience, typically the contractor mm -hmm. or the builder. Uh, whereas, or also the client. But yes. it seems that, that uh, the way you're characterizing it, that the client was maybe responding more to the picture, the picture yes. in yes. your terminology, and that the, the picture is that kind of encapsulation uh, of the ambitions of the project. Yeah. So uh, while there was always a sort of overlap between drawings being used for imaginative purposes and even the pictures occasionally being required to solve certain technical problems. What you're trying to do here in a way is to kind of imagine other collisions of those two types of architectural yeah. drawing. I, I think that distinction is never an easy one historically and I think at this moment for me it was interesting to make them collide into certain techniques that could make both creative at the same time simultaneously and actually not seeing those as being separate and so the pixel world and the vector world would actually come together in a cohesive manner to create something um, that, that's of imagination so it, but has a precision of the drawing. The drawing is where the disciplinary work happens sure. and the picture is more geared toward a more professional responsibility mm -hmm. or salesmanship. And it's the argument that you're making then is that the picture would be limited by that kind of pejorative characterization. I, I, and drawings are yeah. similarly held back by their kind of... Uh, that somehow this dichotomy is not very clear. 
and is historically I think hasn't been clear and I think as of now it's even more interesting to use this fertile place where those two come together. I wanted to take a few minutes with Dennis Delgado, the director of the Industry Gallery, and talk a little bit about what you're up to here and what we might expect in the future. So Industry Gallery was actually founded in 2010 in DC and we've since moved to LA. Um, back in 2013, with actually our first show being with Elena at the Pacific Design Center. And now, us being in downtown, the more appropriate way to kind of kick things off was by having another show with Elena to christen this space, uh, which we just did with building portraits. It does seem that you have an interest in architecture in general, and I wonder if you yeah. tell us a little bit about what is it that draws you to this particular kind of architecture, which maybe uh, right. isn't the most ordinary. And there's two things that we definitely try to center the shows and exhibitions and artists that we work with, one being experimentations in materials, and as well as just experimentations and invention in programming and technology, which was what Elena tends to kind of experiment with. So you'll see kind of that uh, atmosphere happening in this space in terms of the type of artists, designers, architects. I mean, it's kind of hard to put a label per se to these individuals nowadays um, because we here kind of imagine them melding as one. That's kind of what attracted us to Elena. I look forward to seeing more programming here and yeah. uh, thanks very much for your time. These are the pictures of my model making, meaning that I was um, taking the drawings done uh, for the AIC, trying to create uh, a three-dimensional model of a building, and these are the pieces when they are unfolded on the desk. And I took this picture to show how the projection of the drawing actually is cute, and it's all parallel projections, and they have different orientations. And the way in which they come together starts showing that um, there is not really an orientation between windows, real windows and the drawings, but actually they are uh, oriented with the faces. And so you start creating a very different view of what a building should be and should look like. Let me ask you a question. Are yes. these pictures or are they drawings? These are, you know, these are pictures of the drawings. Actually, they're pictures of the model of the drawings. <laughs> I, I know this, this went through many variations. And I think actually every time you go through one iteration, it adds a layer of richness, I think, to the project. I mean, these are very dear to me because they start showing how they could be imagined as being a drawing of a building, but actually these are simply the unfold of something much more complex to dimensionally. They also suggest other figures Configure. in yeah. the way that they work. They, in fact, are all the same pieces, you can see, but they are configured differently. So we had all these pieces together and we started putting them together differently and they started, you know, working out different silhouettes of of different buildings. You could imagine this again to be a facade of singular volumes. You could imagine this being such, but they're actually all together creating a complete volume. And so in a sense, this is the, the models that these generated are just one version of what's possible yes. to come from these. Because that's one of the things that I find really interesting about the way that the show develops, is that it, it begins with a very uh, focused study of the interpenetration of the grids. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it very quickly layers in an idea of building typologies, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, in your attempt to kind of swerve away from those typologies generates these kinds of figures. Mm -hmm. Each step seems to generate kind of unforeseen consequences that open up alternative possibilities. Absolutely. I think actually those drawings came after this, um, this models here where they start thinking about posture and grounds and different orientations. And this started, uh, the fact that you cannot clearly orient a shape and you actually need to decide what the orientation is and how to place the ground was the beginning of the thoughts that were behind all those drawings where you actually see that uh, the pieces are oriented and only the ground is what grounds them into one particular location. These images on the back wall, these have detached themselves from these and also seem to be maybe a little bit more building-like. Well, let's say that these are the last piece of the show. Uh -huh. They've been actually designed for the show. And I was looking at this point at the relationship between shapes and form and trying to understand how simple shapes like a simple uh, rectangle or square could actually find the location and orientation on the ground. And so they are actually quite heavy on their grounding and footings and they find for sure their, uh, their place. But there's something funny about those footings, as yes. you call them, because they seem to me as happy to be called ground as they are to be called figure. They probably are what makes 
this oriented and you, mm -hmm. they make you understand that this is actually a building. It did look more like a building, not because probably the other one were more like buildings than this one, but it's because they're embraced by a ground that is figural. That would make this the figure and that the ground. Otherwise, this becomes the <laughs> grounding element for the... You know, no, 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 I think that... The, I, I bring that up because one of the things that is constantly in my mind as I, as I look at these is Colin Rowe and Robert Slutsky's essays on literal and phenomenal transparency and the kind of uh, illusionistic space that was yes. their main concern. And that space had to do with weaving, it had to do with mm -hmm. overlapping, and it also had to do with a kind of a virtuality. And so, for my money, having a hard time deciding which thing is ground and which thing is figure is not only a kind of asset to the project, but it also ties it back to a much longer conversation in the discipline that has to do with what facades do and how hard the grid has to be manipulated in order to make that doing go. Definitely every single piece of these drawings try to tackle the problem of optical effects uh -huh. and it's with the filigree quality of the lines, uh, with the finish of the print, with the finish of the paper and with the intensity of the line work on top of each other. I mean these are actually quite intensive work to be put together and this layering has the effect of not giving you a stable view of the facade and the idea is that yes the facades still have a very important role in architecture. I think this is mainly my interest actually in architecture. To be honest I think that's where most of my work lies and I think the uh, relationship between the public space and the private space and the experience of the choreograph of the facade is a place for, in great, for great theatricality. Thanks very much for your Thank time you. and hopefully we'll see you soon on the Sire channel.